My name is Amy Lamoureux. Um, I'm here because I am a volunteer at the Howell Archives. Um, I'd like to tell you what got me to that point. And to tell you that, I have to tell you a little bit of the history of my family. I was born in Grand Rapids, um, and when I was four years old, uh, my parents moved us to Detroit. My father uh, was in radio and TV broadcasting, so he got a job uh, in the Detroit area. After that, he got in a sales job. So he was going to be traveling all over the country, and so as a lot of people did, in the early 70s, we moved to Howell because it was kind of a hub for uh, intersection between 23 and 96, close to the airport. So I had the good fortune of moving to Howell in 1972, which was my freshman year in high school. We waited, they waited till the last child was born in Grand Rapids before we relocated to Detroit. We were the only family from my Lamro family that moved away from that area. They settled the area in Comstock Park near Grand Rapids. And I always wondered about that, how they got there. And I just had this feeling in me about wanting to know about that ancestor thing. It's just something that you can't explain that kind of gnaws at you and it never goes away, that, that feeling. And so then when we moved to Howell, my mom was a very big reader, an avid reader. I mean, she read a dozen books a week. And in the 70s, she started reading James Michener. And I don't know if you're familiar with him, but at the time, he, when he wrote a book, um, it was very extensive. Like, for instance, he wrote the book Centennial, I think, which really kind of spurred a lot of thinking in her. And um, it was a story of a, a small town in Colorado, but he starts with um, the geology of the area, how the area was developed, because some of these things might be important to how the people use the land, etc. And I think what happened is that she got thinking, you know, my mom loves to talk to people. I think I got that a little bit from her. Um, and she was at she was with Mike Hagman, something working on something about her car, and she got talking about the history of Howell and said, you know, do you know why this is here or how this was here? Does anybody have this written down? And they got thinking of, they both shared that passion and love of Howell and of history. And so my mom thought, um, kind of a, I think, a twist um, on Michener's thinking that the people of Howell should write the history of Howell in their own words. And she was very specific about that when um, she would talk about it. You don't have to be an author, you don't have to be a historian, a specialist of any kind, but each person has a unique story to tell about what brought them there and into that point. And so, um, I was also in high school involved in the 5th Michigan Regiment Band. Um, my brother was a drummer and I was in the color guard at first. And so from that we became friends with Dave Yanig, who's the editor of the Livingston County Press. And I think um, it started that way. And he's, you know, of course, a huge historian as well. Um, and so Mr. Hagman, and my mom went to see Dave Yanig kind of pitching the idea. And from and he thought, it's good, you know, work something up, keep at it, think about it. And they did, and eventually between the two of them, I think that they were able to assemble probably one of the most interesting groups of people that could be involved in such a project at that time. And now you, now, from my unique perspective, I was in high school, and it wasn't that important to me. I hadn't lived out here that long. I was probably more excited about what was I going to wear to the prom that year, who was going to ask me, could I make the basketball team, you know. These things were more important. So I, I, I didn't pay as much attention to it as looking back I wish I would have. However, 
Um, I do remember when they were doing their initial meetings, my mom would bake a pie or something. They would come over to the house and there'd be Cliff Heller, Mr. Zemper, the flower guy, who guy that owned the, Cliff Heller. oh, that's Cliff. Let's see, who else would be there? Dave Yanig, Roar Baxter. Um, anyways, and they would, you know, uh, you know, throw in different ideas of how to organize this and how to do this. And somehow, miraculously, through all of that, they pulled it off. And it was an amazing thing. But I tell you, for a couple years, from my perspective, it was a little bit of hell because our phone never stopped ringing. You know, that's all we had then was just home phones. And I would pick up the phone and it would be, I remember when it was dot, 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 some man who had a farm way outside of town or somebody was the first guy in the fire department or this. And I'd be like, I think you want my mom, you know, because I was busy. I was, you know, in high school. But, uh, but looking back now, I see, I see what a wonderful and unique thing that she did. So I have to tell you now, so kind of what brought me here. So eventually, that dream I had about wondering where my roots were um, and walking in my ancestors' footsteps never left me. So finally, uh, right before uh, I turned 50, I was able to go to France and do such a thing. And mostly because the internet makes everything, this whole world, a little bit smaller, kind of pinpointed where my ancestors were from. So. Uh, so I was able to go there, and it turned out to be quite a, quite an adventure for me. And when I got home, my family said, you know, you, you should write that, because I wrote a journal, but they said, no, you should write the story of, you know, the stuff that happened to you, not the boring stuff like, you know, you went here and you went there, you know, tell the story. So I did, and um, then they thought I should I should publish it, which I did. And in doing so, I thought, um, I have an angle where I can promote this book, and it's daughter of woman who writes history book, writes her own, follows in her own family's ancestors, you know, something like that. And I remembered that my dad, who was a radio TV guy, he used to um, tape everything he could that had to do with anything in the family, anytime we were in plays or whatever. And my mom was on WHMI being interviewed a couple times promoting the book. And they used to have that afternoon show, the afternoon club. And one time, I think, by herself and with Mr. Hagman, and then another time with Zemp. And I couldn't find it, but I knew my dad had done it. And I know him, and he wouldn't throw that away. And it was donated to the library. I'm pretty sure he, before they moved from the Howell area uh, when they retired that... Um, and so, so I went down to the archives looking for it. And when I was there, that's where I saw Mr. Zemper and Mr. Charbonneau working, and I was trying to find those tapes or information on my mom in the book for promoting my own book. And, uh, um, and that's when I saw what a great need that they had for help in that area. And I thought, if I ever got time, that I would give back, I would go to this archives because now I understand the importance of uh, preserving history, passing on history, the things that my mom d did back then that I didn't appreciate, that I appreciate now. And so that's what got me here in this chair today. Awesome. <laughs> Can I tell you a little bit about my personal growing up, Howell? Sure. Okay. So, um, so I was, a, I was a freshman. There wasn't, uh, it was quite a shock for us when we moved out of here. We moved from Northwest Detroit and I was in a parochial school. And uh, we came out here, I think it was like July 1st, 1972, that Livingston County Press came out once a week on Wednesdays and we got the paper that day or somewhere close around that first day we moved in. You know, it's folded in half and on the front page that you see was a picture and it says, Howell gets first traffic light. 
and my sisters and I looked at that. We're three girls are in the middle. We have two boys below us and two boys above us, and thought, "What fresh hell did my parents just move us to?" Oh my gosh! <laughs> Still have the paper? Um, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to look and see. But we we're thinking, "Oh my, oh my word!" And um, and we were just off of Howell Lake, and uh, a month later, my uncle. Um, gave us a Chris Craft boat. You know those old wooden teak boats? From that moment on, it's like we died and went to heaven. We could not believe our good fortune. Uh, it was good, better for me because I was a freshman and I would have had to change schools anyways. Um, but for my sister who was a senior, it was a little tougher. And um, the, the younger boys were fine. They went to Michigan Avenue Middle School. Um, so we very much enjoyed uh, the change from the city to the country. You know, for me, it was it was really an awesome, awesome way to grow up. Uh, we did the usual things, like we would grab burgers at Anthony's. You know, when they used to have those five, five burgers, for a buck, for five bucks or something after four o'clock, and take those over to Howell Beach. That was like a big to do. And uh, you know, we loved going to the midget uh, Howell House. Um, especially going to Spags where you could sit at the counter, you know, and get the Coke and the, and the cool little triangular cup holder thing there at the uh, counter. That, I love that. Um, we all love going to the dime store with the creaky floors and going up to the counter and asking Aunt Eva, uh, Eva Dunn, to measure us out some candy. It put it in the little bag. I thought that was, that was awesome. Um, I uh, I have to say, um, when, and then I years later I got was pregnant with my twin boys, and I craved those Anthony's Highlander burgers. They had the special Highlander sauce, which is actually an olive sauce of some kind. And I tried to limit myself to you know once a week, and right at the end I was so big with those twins I would like kind of waddle up to. Anthony's there, <laughs> and um, Rose would almost meet me at the door so I wouldn't have to go all the way up to the counter, hand me my bag, I'd hand her the money, you know, it was so big. <laughs> and when they closed, I went and signed their guest book and said, I would like to say that I can attribute the health of my twins directly related to your secret sauce <laughs> at Anthony's. But they never did give me the recipe, I have to, I have to say. Um, was it Howell Lake or was it Thompson Lake? Howell. Howell Lake. Yep. Before I could drive the Chris Craft boat, I had to take swim lessons there. You know, the dock was still there. And uh, my mom made all of us um, take swimming lessons there uh, and life saving before we were allowed to take the boat out. And boating safety classes, too, before we could take the boat out. So I was like lickety split getting all that done. Yeah. The Howell Beach was, was like the hub of activity. And then when we got into high school, when you could drive, then we had a thing we called cruising the gut, which is pretty much from, which is the Kroger's. freshman campus now, to Kroger's, KPL, from Kroger's to KPL, cruising the gut, and just kind of like probably similar to the American Graffiti movie, except not as cool cars probably, and just going back and forth and seeing your friends and, you know, because there just wasn't a lot going on. But um, but it was fun. Yes, I loved the Howell Theater. I still love the Howell Theater. I have a wonderful memory I'd like to share about my mom at the Howell Theater. And it was in high school. You have to remember, I'm from a family of nine people, seven kids and my parents. So we were kind of frugal. She was kind of frugal. Um, and. Gone with the Wind was coming to the Howell Theater, and my mom said everyone should see that on the big screen once in their life. We all had to go. So, you know, in high school, we didn't really know much about that then. And um, so we all asked a few friends, and we filled up one whole row. I don't know, maybe 15, 20 of us. So my mom had on this big trench coat and we got into the Howell Theater and we sat down and she pulls out from underneath her trench coat 
this brown paper Kroger bag full of popcorn that she had popped from home with lunch bags and she filled the popcorn from the giant Kroger bag into the lunch bags and passed it down here to pass it down to your friends you know so we passed it down of course in high school you know I'm like I'm mortified well that was the part that really got me she didn't have any napkins so she whips out this roll of toilet paper <laughs> everybody got a couple <laughs> squares pass it down <laughs> I love that story about my mom. <laughs> I actually wrote uh, uh, something for the Livingston County Press when they said about when they were going to close the theater at one point. Does anyone have a special story? I wrote that story about that, which is probably not good because it was promoting the fact that we didn't buy the <laughs> popcorn. Yet. Yeah, that's evil idea. But, um. So, you know, as a teen here, we didn't have a lot of options. There was Dancers, there was Adams, there was Good Nose, there was Consumers. Joanne Sportsler. I didn't go there. That was considered more grandma for, I'm just saying, when I was in high school. Um, and was it Joanne's and Jones. There was two. Joan Carroll's. Okay, which one was the one that was next to the courthouse on the um, north side? Was that Joan Carroll's? Joanne Sportswear, Joanne Swan owned Joan Sportswear next to Don Yank's. Okay, Steelers. okay, Joanne's. Okay, yeah, that's one I didn't shop in. And then there was another one across the street near Joan, the team room. Joan it, Carroll's was just down from the family restaurant. Okay, and that was way off my budget, as was Adam's. But I had a friend that worked there in high school, and sometimes she would get a deal, and she let me, you know, I, I might have afforded one shirt there in high school. And so we were left to go to um, Meridian Mall, would be a road trip, let's say if you're, you know, prom. Quite often, like early on, I, I used to make my own dresses and stuff for like my early years in high school for proms. And then, um, and then when uh, Novi Mall opened, we were like, oh, wow, this is something, huh? This is pretty cool. And so occasionally we would, that would be like a road trip. Go to Novi Mall. Those were our clothes shopping places. Oh, in Brighton Mall, there was uh, for shoes. We would go to Brighton Mall for shoes. Yep, the Coney, yeah, Brighton Coney Island. We quite often would go there. And uh, Kmart, I think, was the, kind of the anchor store there. I liked the Brighton Mall. That was quite nice. Absolutely. I, re I remember another funny story about my mom. Um, that Coney Island there, um, I had a, I think I was like a senior in high school now, but um, my brother was of an age where embarrassed to be around my mom kind of age. And um, there was a Bozo the Clown ride right outside that Coney Island. And uh, my mom hopped on that and put money in it. She's like, woo, woo. <laughs> my brother was just <laughs> so embarrassed. I was laughing so hard. I thought it was fantastic. I actually try to model her sometimes as my, as my parenting style as well. <laughs> yeah, I think, oh, I, I, might have, I might have gotten that goofed up. That was probably what I was speaking of. It was the Stroh's Ice Cream Place that had a couple little kitty rides outside of it. And it was just before you walked into mm -hmm. Kmart. Yeah. Yeah. So you went around yeah. to the barbershop around the corner. Yep. I remember one time they had, um, they had a big event at the Brighton Mall where they had the car from The Godfather sitting in the inside of the mall there. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And they had, I mean, of course it was all fake, but like bullet holes in it. And they kept playing that music, da na 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 In high school, we're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool, look at that. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, kids would say, well, it's a fake car, okay? There's no, that's it, real bullets in there, Mom. <laughs> when she came into our lives, I already had that feeling in me that I wanted to travel. I wanted to know about other lands and other people. I wanted to know how they lived. I just thought it was very interesting when she would, when we were in high school, when we would talk, I used to ask her like crazy questions like, when you dream, do you dream in Swedish or English? 
or when you, you know, I, I mean, I wanted to know everything about how I never met anyone and never lived with anyone from another country. The more we learned about each other, the more we realized that we were not that different at all, that when it came right down to it, and maybe we were just lucky, that we, we, we both had the same love of family, love of life. Um, we just had a lot of the same characteristics in us, and that always kept us together. For instance, she just sent me a text this morning um, that of a picture of her and her of her family together in Florida, and it's just her sitting by the pool with her girl saying no complaints. So you know, to us, a high quality of life is are those things. Um, having good friends, having good family, having good health, you know, all the just the basic things for us are the good are the good things. We uh, we have another friend in common, um, Carol Murray. Uh, Carol Shemansky from high school, and we every time Ingrid comes in, we're thick as thieves. We're, we're together, and we might not talk for a long time, but when we are together, it's like no time passes. You know, one of those unique experiences. And um, uh, Carol just recently retired, and uh, also turned of a certain age. We're all kind of hitting that milestone. Our group of sixty. And uh, I asked Carol what she would like to do, and she said she'd like to go to New York City. I said, I've never been there. I think we should go. So we organized a trip. Well, come to find out, because my friend is from Sweden is in Florida, she's going to meet us next week in New York City. So not only is she coming back to Howell to see us, we're starting to meet her traveling around. Carol and I have been to Sweden. I've brought my family to Sweden. I've been back to Sweden probably f three or four times now um, and she's been here more times than I can count with her family. We're also becoming friends with with her extended family, with her brother. I know her mom quite well and it's like we share everything. You know, she shared my mom, I share her mom. Um, awesome very, video. very wonderful, unique experience. We. And we do not take it for granted. We know how special it is, and we, and uh, and we love each other for all of that. And you know, she's a she's a big wig doctor in her town in Sweden or whatever. And um, we, we that's not what we love about each other. It's about those things. We love each other for the people that we are, not about what we have or what we've done. It's more about who we are right now. Who got so, each, who got who in the most trouble? Carol. Hands down, Carol. If you're if you're gonna watch us, I'm throwing you totally under the bus. <laughs> it's all your fault, Carol. <laughs> oh, and my sister Kathy. Sister Kathy was big, big in getting us all in trouble. She still is to this day, honestly. <laughs> yeah, and she knows this won't be a surprise to her either. <laughs> With my kids off to college now, I really do love, still love living right in downtown Howell. I walk back and forth for many events. Um, I love some of the changes that have occurred, um, which I fought, which I didn't like, but some of the new stuff I do like now. Um, I can remember liking the fact that we didn't have any big box stores out in this area. Uh, now I'm kind of glad. Sometimes my friends will make jokes like, well, Amy, when was the last time you left the county? You know, really. I'm like, why would I have to? I got everything I need right here. Um, though I still would rather go to Grundy's than to Home Depot. Um, um, sometimes I, I remember I worked for the highway department in between, in the summertime between college and the job was uh, walking up and down the expressways. Um, I had a crew of, of kids that I supervised picking up garbage and stuff. And we used to do part of Grand River because it was part of the highway department then. Not, not right in town, but the outside of town. And there was horse fields. And, um, and I used to think to myself, I'm going to blink my eyes and try and remember what this looks like forever because I know it's going to change. And I, do you remember those Arabian horses? that were on Grand River. I've asked a couple of people this. 
on the north side of the road, and I think it was Latson Road. And, oh my gosh, they were beautiful. They would come right up to the fence. Right across oh, the street. Beautiful from horses. Where the old Dick Sports building is. Right straight across yes, the street. Yes, in that, yes. I was going to say where um, Carson's is now. Yeah, close. In, in that area. I remember when my sister Kathy first got her driving license. Remember, this is the one that got me in, likes to get me in all the trouble. Um, we would take off and cruise. Oh, we just thought it was the most awesome thing driving down all the back roads. And we got onto Latson Road close to Grand River, and somebody's pigs got out of the field, and they were all over the road. And um, so, you know, she's <laughs> driving like that. Um, so we pulled over and tried to find the farmer whose pigs it was. But, you know, can you imagine that happening now at that intersection? Holy cow. I don't even hardly like driving. <laughs> we had a lot of bacon around the area. <laughs> yeah, so we lived Got at jobs. the intersection of, of Golf Club in Grand River, that first subdivision there. And they put that first McDonald's there when the wind blew right. So this is like 1972, 3, 4, 5. Um, you could smell uh, a little whiff of the auction barn mixed with the grease from the McDonald's at the same time. I probably don't miss that smell too much, but <laughs> but that was interesting. We used to go to the auction, my sister Kathy and I, and we just thought that was amazing, you know, coming from the city to sit there and watch the farmers. That was, that was pretty cool. My first memory was um, all these girls get to wear pants because I came from a parochial school. <laughs> they can wear almost whatever they want. Um, kids were running down the hall. I remember that wasn't allowed where I came from. Um, I was a little disappointed at the time. There wasn't hardly, there was barely any sports for women. It was very weird for me because um, I started playing basketball and sports, you know, third grade. We started playing sports. So it wasn't until my sophomore year that they started some girls' sports. And it was bare bones, but we had something. So um, my son, who um, in college is, uh, works at the Eastern Michigan Convocation Center, uh, had the good fortune of working with one of the first Lady Harlem Globetrotters recently. They had the Harlem Globetrotters at Eastern for something, and he got to drive her around. Oh, and also my sisters, Ann and Kathy, were the first girls from Howell to get sports scholarships, which back then was not, you know, we barely had girls' sports, and then they basketball, basketball scholarships. So when Alex was driving this girl around, I said, did you tell her about your family's legacy that, you know, we were the first girls from Howell to have, you know, first girls to play sports in this area? And, you know, sh she can thank my sisters for that. So <laughs> I go, maybe not tell her that part, but <laughs> tell her you're welcome. We trailblazed for her. So. <laughs> so, but we had, you know, homecoming was fun, dances, you know, dances at the gym. I love that part. Were your proms at the high school or were they at Shimong Hills? Uh, it was it was mixed. I think maybe my last one might have been in Lansing at some fancy hotel or something or, you know, Kellogg Center. I can't quite remember. Graduation at Page Field? Uh, yes. Yes, it, it was. It didn't rain that day. No, it didn't. That was awesome. It was quite hot, though. I love that. Do you remember the pageant of drums mm -hmm. at Pagefield? Yeah, there's not a lot of people who remember that either. That was a that was a big thing with Dave Yanig too. He worked with that with uh, Mr. Hagman on the pageant of drums, getting those bands in and such. That was kind of a big to do. Yeah. Yes. I say that because I, I love I had, I had the good fortune of, um, I played the guitar for uh, St. Joe's um, Mass, and on occasion I would travel with Father Rare to uh, remote locations playing guitars for seasonal events. For instance, one time Father Rare and I got in the car and drove out to Hillcrest Center, and at that time um, it was all disabled, uh, mentally impaired uh, children there. 
And so we sang um, Halloween songs for them to the tune of Christmas songs. We changed the words. And we did, I did that kind of stuff with Father Eric. That was kind of cool. That was, that was kind of special. I always enjoyed my conversations with him. Yeah. He would talk about anything. Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was a good guy. I, I know that it was one of my mom's favorite places on the planet. I know she loved the library. I inherited her bag that says, I love the library that somebody gave her for, from here. <laughs> Um, I do, I'm not sure if I said this, but I think it's important for me to say that when I look back now, especially with just the short time that I've been working in the archives, um, I see now that what my mom started and it became bigger than her, um, and what those people pulled off with that bicentennial book was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, when I look at that book, when I look at the effect that it had on this community in the short time that she was here uh, to do that, um, I mean, she gave it her all. Our, like I say, our phone never stopped ringing. She was either at meetings or meetings were at our house. Uh, she was off all the time doing all types of promotional things. And to listen to her talk to people were telling her, her their stories. And I, I do remember the look on my mom's face that no matter what these people were telling her, that to her it was the coolest thing she ever heard and that they had a right to have that story in that book, that everyone should be heard and everyone should be in there, and that everyone's story and participation in this community was important and made it the unique environment that it is. Oh, here's another sidebar. I'm not sure I told you this. But, you know, when I started working at the archives, and I had the good fortune of working with Mr. Zemper, and Zemp, it's hard for me to call him Zemp, but I did sometimes. And every once in a while, I would catch him staring at me. And, uh, and I can tell you, of all my seven brothers and sisters, especially the girls, I, I know I am most like my mom. I have a lot of her characteristics. I know I have a lot of her reflection in my voice, etc. But he'd stare at me, and finally he said, I am so sorry. I apologize. I know that I am staring at you, he said, but I cannot help but see you sound and look so much like your mom that it is just wonderful for me. And I said, please, don't, don't be sorry in the least. I said, for just to hear you say that to me makes my heart feel very warm and closer to my mom and uh, and that I you know I miss her very much I miss her all the time and um, and so from that point on we kind of had a special relationship when we would go in there it was like it was different from that point on we were I was like the daughter of his this woman that I could tell that he admired what she did as well and that he respected what she did as well and um, it was it was very nice, and I have to say that was one of the the coolest things for me, was even though it was a short time, it was a good time that I got to work, and in, in, uh, with Zemp, and uh, God dang, he was one of the funniest people I have met in my life, so that was a bonus.